Hi, welcome to week four of Regenerating the Spirit of Democracy. I am Gary Peluso Verdan from the Center for Religion and Public Life at Phillips Theological Seminary. Um, this session is on marks of a healthy democracy. It's going to be a little different from the ones we've done before, and I hope you enjoy what we do. <clears throat> For the devotional reading today, um, oh, and by the way, I have to say I am again assisted by uh, Professor Joe Cool and his assistant Woodstock, so I appreciate their help. Uh, <clears throat> this is a segment from Frederick Douglass's speech in 1869 called A Composite Nation, it's a very forward-looking speech. It was about in the con or said in the context of uh, debates around Chinese immigration. Uh, now his speech didn't ultimately uh, win the day, as in something like 1882, the United States uh, severely restricted immigration from China uh, until uh, well into the 20th century. Um, but listen to this vision of the nation from 1869. In whatever else other nations may have been great and grand, our greatness and grandeur will be found in the faithful application of the principle of perfect civil equality to the people of all races and of all creeds and to men persons of no creeds. Of no creeds. We are not only bound to this position by our organic structure and by our revolutionary antecedents, but by the genius of our people. Gathered here from all quarters of the globe by a common aspiration for rational liberty as against caste, divine right governments, and privileged classes, it would be unwise to be found fighting against ourselves and among ourselves. It would be madness to sit up any one race above another or one religion above another or proscribe any on account of race or color or creed. That's a great message for a week before our national election. Thank you once again, one of the, certainly one of the greatest Americans of the 19th century, and, and certainly amongst the top one or two orators, Frederick Douglass. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to do this week is I have an opinion survey. Um, I have listed out uh, 15 different marks, I think, of a healthy democracy. And, and I want you to take a look at, I'll have a, this slide reappears every, after every one of the marks. Um, and uh, either in the presentation or in the slides, uh, which again, I'll send to you, um, write down uh, how, what do you think of each of those marks? Is that a healthy mark for us in, the, in this democracy right now? Um, uh, does it have something of a cold? Uh, is it the flu or maybe something that's potentially more serious like COVID? Uh, is it on life support or is it really one that you consider dead? And if it's going to be uh, a, a mark at all, it's going to have to be reinvented, regenerated, resuscitated. Um, and then at the end, you'll have a chance to tally up uh, your vote. Um, I'm not going to reveal what mine are today, uh, and uh, we'll talk about them on Thursday. Okay, let's get th to them. Each person is raised to develop their capacity to govern themselves, to contribute to civic life, and to participate in the democracy. What the democracy needs is knowledgeable, virtuous in terms of public virtues, as John Adams speaks of it, virtuous, active citizens. Uh, this is an exercise in, in, in limited government, which requires a whole lot of self-governance uh, derived in a variety of different ways. So that's my first. And go ahead and think about now, is this healthy at level three, level two, level one, or dead? Okay. Next, equality, mutuality, and reciprocity are as highly valued as freedom. Equality, mutuality, and reciprocity are highly valued as is freedom. So, super free, super equal. How do you balance those? 
Are we about, are we, did we have the right balance today in our democracy between equality and freedom um, and the freedom we want and claim for ourselves? Do we mutually, do we grant that, recognize that, work for that, protect that in others? Okay. Uh, and your opinion? What's your four, three, two, one, zero? Right. Next. A robust, effective system of public education. Because again, you need that a, 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 an educated public in order to run a democracy, especially in a complex world uh, as we have today with all of the kinds of decisions that need to be made. So uh, does that education prepare one for civic life, which a public education ought to do? Uh, does it help one discern a, and, and, and lay a, a, a base of education for vocation, uh, for whatever that happens to be, and for pursuit of happiness, which remember uh, in the Declaration did not mean personal happiness uh, as much as it did uh, public happiness, uh, happiness that you can't have all by yourself. So what's your judgment? Is that a four, three, two, one, zero on education, public education? All right. Um, the use of money in campaigns and elections is transparent and limited. Wasn't quite sure how to word this one, uh, except, yes, this grows out of my sense, and um, certainly not alone, that money is way too controlling in politics today. Um, uh, between you know politicians who say, uh, especially at a, at a, at a um, federal level, who say the minute they're elected, uh, they have to start uh, campaigning again and, and, and raising donations, uh, and uh, and the Citizens United decision, uh, which I didn't think was a good one. But again, this is my list, uh, and uh, you'll have your own. Uses of money in campaigns and elections is transparent and limited, okay? Um, for you, uh, is that uh, healthy, has a cold, flu, life support, dead? Um, um, it makes me think, as I, as I think of this one, maybe I should have had another um, uh, category of another line. Uh, not mine. Uh, I don't agree with that one. Uh, you'll have a chance to do that in our discussion. Um, free and fair access to voting, secure elections, and attention to ensuring that every vote matters. Because if you don't have free and fair elections, you really cannot have a democracy. All right. Um, so, um, what's your vote on that? Healthy, cold, flu, one zero. All right. Uh, a culture of conversation and argument sufficient to have the arguments we need to have, uh, meaning that there is trust and accountability at the table. Uh, even in a con high conflict situation, if there is no trust, you're not gonna have people at the table, right? So, so in order for people to be at the table and using our words rather than violence in order to um, um, reach the agreements we need to have, uh, you need to have a culture that includes some trust. It has to have also a sufficient level of accountability. And in a democracy, you have to expect conflict. So it has to be argument, not just argument. We hope there's conversation along with the argument, um, but you have to have a culture of conversation and argument. Otherwise, again, you're, you, you kick your decisions over to other decision-making bodies, such as an executive or such as courts, if you cannot deliberate together. Four, three, two, one, zero. Which is it for you? Um, a government large enough and well-funded enough to accomplish its ends. By large enough, I liked uh, what I once heard David Brooks say in a speech about uh, we shouldn't be asking about uh, you know small government, big government. Those are the wrong terms. Uh, the, the more correct term, the more helpful, not correct, the more helpful term would be 
to think in terms of how large does government need to be in order to accomplish its proper ends. And I know we have debates about what the proper ends of government are. Um, and I love that political cartoon because it pretty well talks about the spectrum that we're, we're dealing with. Um, but it has to be well-funded enough to accomplish its ends, to, to put something on government and then starve that government. Or the other way around, of course, uh, for government to impose a, a regulation, let's say, on public schools without any sort of ability to fund that regulation, those unfunded mandates, also very difficult. Government large enough, well-funded enough to accomplish its ends. Four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, governed by officials who earn the public trust daily through competent work, and practices of accountability, including well-functioning checks and balances. Love that cartoon. The book uh, pauses, but does not actually stop here. Um, uh, this probably sounds like a no-brainer. Uh, uh, without, again, trust in the, uh, from the public, um, our, those who are charged with our governance don't have what they need to operate. Uh, and if they haven't earned that trust, uh, and we haven't given that trust, uh, practices of accountability, I think, is one of the ways what, that one earns trust, uh, and you need those checks and balances. It's one of the great things about our system when it's working properly is checks and balances because it assumes even the best people can be tempted if, if they are doing public work outside of public accountability in some way. So, four, three, two, one, or zero. A pragmatic and principled ability to compromise. Uh, pragmatic as in if you want to get anything done, um, and principled, it's not just a matter of going totally uh, against one's principles and giving up one's principles in the compromise. But compromise itself is something of a principle, right? Uh, in order to have different parties remain at the table um, and, and to work through the conflicts you need to work through, either there's a winner or a loser, or you find some way to win-win and some way perhaps to everybody loses some, everybody wins some, but, uh, but for one side to be consistently the victor, uh, you are going to then have an oppressed class and a empowered class. So compromise, to say that we need to be able to compromise in order to move things forward, is in fact a principle of perhaps having a union at all. Four, three, two, one, zero. Um, love this cartoon. Uh, the rights of political minorities are protected by the majority. Um, again, that seems to make intuitive sense. Uh, the minority can't protect their own rights. It takes the majority, when the majority is in office, to recognize the rights of the minority, of the political minority, of those, uh, those without power. Um, but it also, that's, a, that's, that's a, a, based on a claim of, well, we actually need the other side of the other sides in order to keep us honest. Hmm. Four, three, two, one, or zero. Uh, there's a broad, deep, principled toleration of differences. Uh, the painting on the lower left is of the death of Socrates, who was executed for corrupting the youth by telling them to question. Um, and Teresa Bajan's book I've referred to before, Mere Civility, um, what does actually civility mean? Um, and certainly a part of civility in the modern world has been how do we use words to live with our differences um, and settle our conflicts, or manage, I should say, our conflicts, because a lot of conflicts are not resolved, they are managed. Uh, 
how do we do that in a again a, a, a world of polarization? And she looked back to uh, the 1700s, 1600s, and 1700s, looking for answers at the start of this period where no religion isn't going to hold the society together. Uh, what will? Um, how to? And certainly toleration of differences and is a piece of that. Um, and I say broad and deep because this is a principle that shouldn't be sacrificed when things get difficult. Uh, uh, so without a principle for it, if it's just a, you know, in the moment I will, um, but as soon as I have the power, I'm going to make sure that those differences are wiped out, uh, not so much principled. Is that a four, three, two, one, or zero? Uh, the criminal justice system is aligned towards correction and reform and restoration, um, as well as toward protection of victims and of the society. Um, you see on, on your right uh, two very different ones, the dunking of witches uh, as one version of a criminal justice system uh, and a, a graphic uh, that shows something quite different. This is as opposed to a retributive justice system uh, where the emphasis is on punishment, regardless of whether or not there's any uh, penitence going on in penitentiaries. Pen penitentiaries. Um, so uh, a retributive justice system is lock them up and throw away the key. Um, and, and again, punishment oriented versus, um, well, um, what is a way of, uh, of restoring the uh, balance uh, that was uh, uh, that was destroyed or shattered or harmed uh, by what the person who committed the infraction did, and and how is society healed after that versus locking people up and and uh, creating a, a very grand um, private prison in, and and jail uh, industry. Um, uh, while also protecting uh, those who have been victims of those crimes and protecting society when protection is, is uh, what is absolutely required. Is that a four, three, two, one, zero? A well-developed, effective means of dissent, correction, and redirection. That is part of the freedom of, sp of speech and assembly in the First Amendment. Um, and it is somewhat under scrutiny, if not outright attack. Uh, sometimes it is outright attack today. Um, uh, but you've got to have means to correct. If you think you're perfect already, you never need correction. Um, I hope... We on, uh, who are viewing this and have been discussing together recognize that the United States of America is is as great a country as we may be. Are we are uh, not perfect, and we have more to learn. We have corrections to make. So therefore, we need to be able to defend rights and dissent. Is that a four, three? two, one, or zero right now. Um, care for neighbors and uh, rehearse, and we care for neighbors and we have opportunities for rehearsals for public life through a rich mix of non-governmental and voluntary organizations. Um, Daniel Patrick Monaghan once said, if you want government to be smaller, people need to care more. Um, and, and in our society, one of the, one of the, not quite unique, but nearly unique aspects of our society that was first noticed in the 1830s by Alexis de Tocqueville uh, and published out in Democracy in America is that we just don't have the state and the individual. We have the state, the individual, and, oops, and a huge host of voluntary organizations, uh, which includes, of course, in our country, uh, uh, religious organizations, but not just religious organizations. And so we learn, in fact, both through the family as well as through participation in these voluntary organizations. Um, we learn how to, and as well as given 
opportunities to care for our neighbors, um, as well as uh, oftentimes rehearse for public life. Uh, I've heard so many uh, parents say over the over the years when I did youth ministry that one of the, one of the aspects of church that they appreciated uh, is in fact the ways in which the uh, combination of deliberation and decision making within the group, as well as uh, and opportunities for public speaking, opportunities to to um, participate in service projects and the like, they the parents felt like this this was great preparations for their kids for uh, public life even beyond congregations. The United States is at a four, three, two, one, zero. All right, and this is a really, for me, this is a really interesting one that I've, I've come to embrace more and more. Uh, and I referred to uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, the book by Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, and she helped me think about this. In meaningful ways, the past, future generations, other living beings, and the planet get a vote. Because we don't get to do this democracy thing. We don't get to do this United States of America experiment uh, apart from a healthy planet uh, with that mm, healthy soil uh, and air and water and all that is necessary in order to have a flourishing society rather than maybe like the ancient Mayan uh, who uh, perhaps uh, some combination of expanded population and climate change and drought uh, uh, drove a particularly grand civilization completely um, uh, uh, out of power uh, as they once had. Um, the map, by the way, on the uh, right, on the left-hand side of the screen uh, is a really interesting one. Uh, 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 Dr. Kiminer talks about um, the uh, various nations of trees in the United States uh, that uh, uh, for her people, um, Maple Nation is very important. Uh, the, the part of the U.S. where maple trees are most uh, uh, significant and you see that's the dark red in this, uh, uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in the slide. Uh, take note of the projection of whether or not uh, places like upstate New York and Vermont, New Hampshire, and the like, uh, on up into Maine, uh, if they're going to be able to support maple trees uh, as if, if the climate keeps changing as projected. Future generations ought to have a vote. In some way, the planet ought to have a vote, at least in the way that we consider our legislation. Uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, it will take people who care about the future of the planet to include the planet in their deliberations. Is that a four, three, two, one, zero? All right, so after you've gone through all of this and you tell, you can tally up and, and this would be the ranges then, for our uh, for determining is our democracy relatively healthy? Does our democracy have a cold? Does it have that flu? Is it on life support or is it um, on its deathbed? Um, um, we'll see. We'll see what you have to say. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Um, so priming the pump for questions this week. Do you disagree with any of these claims about a healthy democracy? If so, why? Um, and please, that that'll that, that would make for some lively conversation. What did I miss in this list? I got 15 of them here. Um, I'm sure I've missed something. So be real curious what you come up with. And priming the pump for next week, we're going to deal with our uh, class question specifically, how my practices from religion and related spiritualities contribute to a more healthy democracy. Uh, so that's the presentation for this week. Uh, I look forward to Thursday, the uh, video interview that, I'll, that also will be available this week is with a, a person well known to many of you, Diana Butler Bass, who believes that a great deal of her work in, 
uh, in writing over uh, probably some 20 years now has been in fact about the intersection between democracy and Christianity. So uh, looking forward uh, to our discussion on Thursday. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.